This is the EWN Radio Network. Welcome to On the Record with your host, Ashram Lux Lucis. Of On the Record. I'm your host, Astrum Lux Lucis, and today's special guest is a classically trained singer, composer, and author. In 2013, she completed a Kickstarter funded cross country musical journey titled An American Songline, performing 30 concerts of vintage music on venues along the Lincoln Highway, America's first transcontinental road. She has written a book and recorded an album based on these travels, and will be back in the studio recording a new album of World War I music later this year, which will be released in 2017. She is also an in-demand crowdfunding consultant and speaker, and will be publishing a book in 2016 titled The Ten Commandments of Crowdfunding. She loves sharing America's history through song, and when she is not on the road, she lives in Portland, Oregon. Please welcome special guest Cecilia Otto. Thank you so much, Astrum. It is great to be here. Yeah, great to have you, and boy, am I eager to delve into your world. But before we go right into what I really want to know, let's get a little history. Tell us okay. about the little girl with a dream. What what was it that you wanted to be when you grow up, and was it a singer, and, and how did that evolve for you? Yeah, it, it, it's been an interesting evolution. You know, I um, music's always been a part of my family. It's one of those things that, you know, they were quick to – um, no, even when I was young, that, you know, various people played music or performed music back a few generations. And so I think it's always kind of been around. But uh, my mom is also very quick to note that uh, I think it was my preschool Christmas pageant when we all had this moment where I'm standing there and I'm supposed to sing and do these choreographed movements in front of an audience. And I guess, and I have no memory of this, I actually turned my back to the audience and did all of the movements and sang in time perfectly, but did it so I couldn't see the audience because I guess I was that nervous <laughs> about oh, wow. it. And, yeah, and my mother, of course, everybody went up to my mom afterwards and was, you know, in that nice passive aggressive way of, you know, what's wrong with your child, kind of did this <laughs> thing of like, you know, she stood up for me and then said, well, you know, she wasn't doing the singing and the movements for you. She was doing it for Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is magic. <laughs> so I always had good advocates in my corner from there on out. But um, I just always loved singing. And, you know, I, this might date me a little bit, but when Annie came out in the 80s, everybody loved Annie. And I had a nanny dressed and a nanny doll and various other things I got up in front of my second grade class a few years later and sang a solo. I sang one of the songs from Annie and I had people say, you sound exactly like her. And I was shocked and surprised and it just kind of planted a seed to kind of keep going with it. You know, I didn't really know anything at that point, but I just knew I liked doing it and I just wanted to keep moving forward with it. So um, it was, it was, a little trepidatious at first when I was young, but then it just kind of kept going from there. I mean, they found I had vibrato when I was 12 years old and uh, they, they wanted, there was this debate about wanting to put me in voice lessons early. And there was, you know, a huge contention of that because it's kind of similar to weightlifting. And if you kind of start classical training too early, it can almost actually wreck your throat depending on what you're doing. So wow. um, they waited until I was 14 and I've actually been taking voice lessons ever since because your body keeps changing and growing and those hormones keep doing different things. And mm -hmm. it's just something that is a lifelong thing because you are constantly in tune with your instrument, both physically and kind of emotionally, and you need to kind of work through different things. But um, it was kind of a sign then you know, that there was something more to kind of get this classical training and background to kind of prevent nodules in my throat and to do good breathing techniques and things like that. And um, 
And then in high school, uh, I actually, I grew up in the state of Minnesota, and they have kind of these different art magnet schools. I know each state kind of does it differently. And some of them have, like, here's a science immersion school, and here's an art school, and here's this. And Minnesota had started this version where it was, like, fame for the 90s. That's kind of what I called it. That's what it was like to me. more there was more flannel and less leg warmers. That's kind of what happened. And, um, <laughs> but my junior and senior year of high school, I actually had to audition. Like it was a conservatory for this specific state school where all these kids came in from different parts of the state and we auditioned and we all lived together and there were only a hundred spots and you could apply for diff- six different disciplines. And, um, I decided to delve into that and become, you know, go into this a little bit more intensely and I got accepted. So that was kind of an even further sign to, you know, really keep going with this, with my training and, you know, and then there was college and grad school and everything else. So, yeah, I I don't know how much you want to hear about my background and training, but it's been in music. I have two master's degrees in music, actually. One's in vocal performance and one's in composition. Yeah, I'm also a composer of music as well, as you said so wonderfully in the introduction. So, yeah. Father has a business, strictly second hand. Everything from toothpicks to a baby grand. One kind of aha moment when I was a child that where I really went, I want to do this, like it just kind of cemented it, was the the year we got cable and we got MTV in our household. And I (laughs) actually saw Jeff Tate from Queensryche sing for the first time. 
Oh and my I God. heard him and I turned to my brother and I said, I want to do that. And I remember that moment of saying, I want to do that. I want to have a voice like that. And I thought it was so cool that he had this kind of, you know, professional kind of background, but then was kind of doing rock. And I just thought yeah. it was the coolest thing ever. And I, you know, knew then that, like, there was kind of this, like, I won't sacrifice who I am, you know, yeah. if I just yeah. do whatever I want to do. And so, yeah, believe it or not, Jeff Tate is kind of my first inspiration for kind of going down the classical path. Because, you know, in small town Minnesota, there's not orchestras. You know, there's not those kinds of classical access that you have other than, you know, national public radio kind of thing. And it was around, but it wasn't prevalent like folk and rock were. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, if I ever met Jeff Tate, I would thank him for the career that I have on some levels because I wouldn't <laughs> have been where I am without him, you know. So, yeah. The people who got me started in music, actually, it was MTV, but it was the Go-Go's. <laughs> okay. So. I saw them on MTV in like 1981 and, and I was playing alto saxophone at the time and mm -hmm. saw them and I was like, oh, wow. Like I didn't, like I can do that. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then I'm like, mom, I don't want to play saxophone anymore. I want to play drums. So got a drum set and I told everybody <laughs> yeah. I was going to be the Go-Go's next drummer. So <laughs> yeah. right on. Well, and I think it's, it's so interesting because we as women musicians, I kind of hear this over and over again, no matter where I go, it's kind of this thing of we kind of just fall into it in a different way, you know, and I mm -hmm. caught this a lot and I still do as a composer, you know, that it's and especially in a male dominated kind of thought process. It's interesting to note that like, I didn't even think of myself as a composer because, you know, we're not necessarily thought or encouraged to be musicians, composers, even producer, mm -hmm. you know, music producers, I mean, you name it. And it was actually in that high school I was telling you about, it was a woman theory teacher who was a very prominent composer in the Twin Cities who said, I like what you're doing. Do you write? And I said, no, not at all. And she said, you should really think about it. And I was like blown away because I wasn't, in, you know, and it wasn't anybody's fault. It's just that no one's thinking that way. And yeah. even in graduate school, when I was doing my master's in composition, which, again, was just another wonderful, happy accident of getting extra scholarships and whatnot to stay on for <laughs> an extra year, you know, it was one of those things where, um, you know, people would ask, like, you know, what's your writing process? And it would be this whole thing of, like, what are you talking about? It, there's, it comes from a different place because there isn't this kind of drilled, like, I have to be like Mozart, and here's the little motive that signals the girl in trouble, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it never occurs to me that way because, to me, music comes from a different source, you know, when I am thinking mm -hmm. about writing and performing. And so I still get perceptions. I still get people. And I think some of it's a generational thing, you know, and to be honest, but I get a lot of old men that will say, you know, you should be a singer, you know, because that's what girls do. And they're like, and of course, on the inside, I'm just like, uh-huh. And I'm happy to do singing. And I believe that I, you know, have that gift and I want to share it with the world. But you know, if something comes out compositionally, that's going to get shared too. And it's just, it's just such a weird, interesting journey that we still subtly kind of run up against this resistance and thought process. And, um, but it is an interesting way how we become more powerful and more kind of neat, you know, amazing musicians because it comes from a different place other than someone kind of indoctrinating you with this is what kind of musician you're supposed to be, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, then yeah. I, I thought I'd put that out there. Yeah. 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 It's like as women artists, musicians, singers, songwriters, we're more tuned in, tapped in, turned on to our higher self and, and mm -hmm. kind of, at least for me, like I open up that, like, well, uh, the channel somehow opens. I don't know how it happens. It opens and then it just flows through me. And mm -hmm. so there isn't like this methodical, sort of left brain mathematical well you've got you know 10 bars of this and then three bars over here and then you need to go to this escal i'm like well that sounds good and then if i do this well that sounds good mixed with that and then if i did this like over here you know and to me it's always been like right. well, if it sounds good do it like i don't care like if it's uh you know music theorily correct or not it's like does it sound right. good you know does it make me yeah. move 
well, then it's good, you know? Like, I used to remember right. in um, music theory class, which I loathed, um, they'd be <laughs> like, too, oh, because first yeah. of all, it was at like 7 in the morning. I'm like, what musician is going to class at 7 in the morning, please? You know? <laughs> so I was like the rebel, and, and we'd get into class, and I'd already be late because, you know, too early and the two were going over like Mozart or something look how Mozart broke the rule over here and I'd like raise my hand well you know if Mozart broke the rule like why do I even need to learn it in the first place like what well, tell me why and they would just right? look at me like just go just get out go get some coffee leave you know it's like <laughs> yeah you know if it sounds good play it you know and then that's probably relative exactly you know same but no hey it sounds good to me then that's all that matters <laughs> you know exactly so, exactly pe- people in my yeah. tribe will like it too because we'll, we have mm-hmm. the same sound you know <laughs> so there you go mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly yeah. yep yeah so outside of college now so what were you doing to put bread and butter on the table so once I got done with grad school and college and all that other stuff. Yeah. Is, so even beyond the two master's degrees. Well, what happens, of course, because I was on an opera track at that point, um, you know, because they found that I had this kind of really big voice. And so I just kept going with the classical training and doing a lot of work in opera and operetta. The general rule of thumb, what happens with a lot of opera singers is that you start auditioning for a lot of young artist programs and apprenticeship programs. It's actually one of the few traditions where you still apprentice into the unions and things like that. Um, mm. So I was going on a ton of auditions. I called it the hamster wheel where it was like apply, sing, get rejected. We compare rejection <laughs> letters with the other friends who auditioned to see, did you get rejection letter A or B or C? Oh, you got the postcard. Wow. They really didn't like you, you know? And um, <laughs> like, it's just, you put them in a binder and then you just kind of keep going because uh, you know, and of course with certain vo- voice types, there's a little bit more psychological drama, but for my voice type being a mezzo soprano at the time, but mezzo contralto now, you know, there's not as many roles. So it's very character specific for my voice type. So it depended on what they, you know, what they were doing for that production that year. So I'm very good in the classical realm of, you know, they call it the mezzo's curse, but you play the witches, you play Mm. the witches, you play the pants roles, (laughs) and you play the other, you know, the, the biatches. So, you know, you play the people that aren't nice that end up dead, which are honestly way more fun characters, right? Um, but it puts it as a, at a very limited kind of range. And so um, I either knew if I was going to get it or not, basically on these one to two roles. And um, it's amazing how, you know, even in higher forms, higher, and I'm putting that in quotes, you know, air quotes as I'm talking to you, forms of music mm-hmm. that um, – it's really subjective. They, they say it's about the music and the voice, but it can be about how you look and it can be about budgeting. I mean, I knew people who didn't get roles because they wouldn't fit into the costumes for that season. They were too tall. Oh, they were too, you know, whatever, because they didn't have the money to recostume them, yeah. you know, and, yeah. or they were, they would be an understudy for the real paid famous person. And that paid famous person looked a certain way. And so they had to have that person, you know, that apprentice look a similar way. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, I had a lot of um, times where because of me playing kind of those older women on stage, because I mean, I'm 5'10", I'm pretty tall. So having that height on stage automatically makes you older because somehow Mm. you look more bigger and more imposing and whatever. (laughs) And so I, uh, I ended up going for a lot of, you know, great older women type roles. And I had people that said, you're going to be great in 20 to 30 years. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Where I was this whole <laughs> nice. kind of like, I know you're trying to be helpful with that compliment, but at the <laughs> meantime, this is a little frustrating because I've been on, you know, dozens of auditions at this point. And this hamster wheel was going around and I was getting some kind of, some paid work at the, at this point I was in Chicago living and kind of doing that earning, but it wasn't as much as I wanted to, cause it was right around 2008. So as soon as everything kind of went, you know, bus programs started getting pulled and ensembles got smaller. So I was the new kid on the block and they wanted to hire the old kids on the block because they knew their talent, they knew their voice, you know, all that other stuff. 
And I was just kind of really sick of that hamster wheel. I was just getting sick of it because I knew that my days were numbered. But I knew that I had these two master's degrees, and I kind of had that moment of like, okay, Stacey, what do you really want to do with your life, you know? What do you really want to do? You know, I call it the come to Jesus moment. And I was just (laughs) like, you know, I really boiled it down. I took an Artist's Way course. I don't know if you've ever done by Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. It's um, a great it's a it's a great thing if you've been in the ivory tower of academia for a really long time, you know, <laughs> because you need to kind of blow those myths out of the water and get your head out of being in that institution for as long as you have been and really think about your art in an outside of the box kind of way. And so after doing that course, I just kind of said, all right, um, here's what I want to do with my life. I want to sing. I want to travel because I was, a travel bug bit me pretty early and stuck ever since. I've actually lived abroad and sang abroad and stuff. Um, I also wanted to write words and I wanted to write music. And I thought, all right, this is what I want to do. So what does that look like? And then, then the word singing travelogue popped into my head. And I went, that's really interesting. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> you know, It was like I, I had to go. I had to actually sit with it for a while and um, really think about what I thought that that might look like. And I think that's kind of a, 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 you know, crossroads point that I think about, you know, with other musicians who might have out of the box ideas where you have this idea, but you go, Oh, I don't know what to do with this. And then you just kind of put it to the side and you ignore it or you think it's not good. And the truth Mm -hmm. is, is that it is good you just need to let it sit with you for a while because then you know you're onto something bigger. You know, you're onto something mm. greater because it takes time to reveal itself in that sense. And um, I just, how could I do with the type of voice I had some kind of singing travelogue? And I got the idea of um, doing a type of song line. Um, I read the book, The Song Lines by Bruce Chatwin, and it's basically about what Australia, Australia, you know, Australia's Aborigines do when they go on walkabout. And what they do is they follow these ancestral trails and sing their ancestors back into existence. And I thought hmm. that's an amazing idea, and I want to do something like that here in America. And so I had to sit with that longer again, while in the meantime, you know, to kind of also go back to your other question of how was I supporting myself? I mean, I was temping big time. I was the queen temp. If there was an Elvis movie about temping, that's what I did, you know, because I, <laughs> I, I wanted to have that flexibility with auditions, but I also wanted, I needed to make money and I needed to have health insurance because of course my voice is attached to my body. So my health's important you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing, but I needed the flexibility. And the one kind of thing that made it, you know, not, I, I couldn't necessarily do reception work because of course, as you can imagine, talking on the phone for eight hours a day, it can yeah. wear your voice down. So mm-hmm. I ended up doing things that were like filing and payroll and things where you have those quiet moments to just kind of not talk to people and kind of think to yourself about, what does singing travelogue mean? And then you kind of, you know, meditate on it like a monk for weeks at a time while you're filing <laughs> forms and things. And, um, you know, it was, it was frustrating, of course, because I wasn't doing my art full time, but I knew that I, if I kept going, I would figure out something and it, I would make it work. And um, so the singing travelogue idea is percolating in my head. And then, you know, this songline idea is percolating in my head and I, you know, said, how can I get to a point where I could kind of make this work and marry the two? And I then thought about the autumn, you know, the roads that we have in this country, you know, the love affair with cars we have, the whole romantic notion of going east to west and how much that's such a huge part of our culture. And I looked at the national auto trail system. So all the black and white signs, not the interstate solace and boring signs, right? Because I don't want to, I don't want to do a singing travelogue of truck stops. Okay, I want to do something <laughs> a little more classy. Um, That's no 2019. People who love trucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the 2019 tour. <laughs> the, the truck stop tour. I'll have pieces yeah. made by then, too. So it'll be really awesome. <laughs> like, oh, she did the Flying J Travel Plaza in Wyoming. <laughs> nice. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I 
started looking at these old roots and saw all this great history that I didn't even know was there, you know, that they don't teach you in history school. And I thought, wow, you know, we've been driving on these roads that literally pioneers followed. And these were Revolutionary War trails and Civil War trails and, you know, Oregon Trail, I mean, you name it. And uh, I saw that America's first transcontinental road had some music about it. There were some songs written about it. The Lincoln Highway is talked about in the introduction, but it wasn't like Route 66 or Highway 61, you know, where everybody knew about it and there were songs about it. And, you know, I've had people over the years that are like, what, you should do Route 66. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I don't need to. Everybody's doing Route 66, you know, mm -hmm. that's been done. Let's do something different and let's have, you know, these other songs kind of come back to life. And so I found songs about the Lincoln Highway. I saw that there was a birthday coming up. It was turning 100 in 2013. And I thought, aha, that's my singing travelogue right there. I'll go mm. from coast to coast doing these concerts along the route, singing songs about the highway. But the neat part that really got, I, I really am big into community involvement. And I actually reached out to different historical um, archives and historical societies along the 14 states and said, I'm doing this. Can you, do you have any old programs from the time period? So anything from 1913 to pre-World War II. And I said, can you show me what was performed, whether it's a classical program or informal or not? I mean, I had students programs, you know, student recitals from a hundred years ago. Wow. And I looked at what people performed and I found some really great stuff. And I thought, here's another great way to show this community another portion of their history of like this song was performed, uh, you know, on this stage, you know, a hundred years ago and here's who did it and then, you know, talk about it in that way. And so it was a neat mix of both what was going on in their community, songs about the highway. And then I actually had a fellow composer approach me because he was writing some orchestral suites, found out about what I was doing and said, I'd love to write two songs for your tour. And we took this old 1916 guidebook with all of its flowery poetry telling people not to wear new shoes and don't forget the camp rice <laughs> and make sure you have 10 pounds of potatoes in your car. You know, like all this stuff that's just so funny now because we don't need that anymore, you know. And we picked our favorite lines and wrote two, he wrote two songs kind of a, excerpts from this book from a hundred years ago. So there was kind of this, you know, faux poetry with history and, and a contemporary feel to that as well. And people love that song of the do's and don'ts, you know, like don't drink alkali water. It causes cramps, you know, <laughs> wow. Had no idea about, it, but it was, it was great. And so then I knew I had a good program that people would want to listen to and would want to, be, you know, that would be interested in because it would be about their community, but it would be about this road that they didn't really know anything about. And it kind of was a great way to bring history to life in a way that wasn't encased in a book, you know? So yeah. that's kind of how all of this evolved. And yes, eventually I like, I'm not tipping anymore. And you know, I had to kind of, <laughs> you know, get get I had to get funding for this and um it wasn't as easy as it looks. I had a lot of people that said you should apply for grants and the problem comes in is that when you have no proof of concept and boy oh boy I, you know all of us musicians have this issue in our own way. You know, it's this whole well you mm -hmm. have no proof of concept so I'm not gonna believe in you and what you do and I was rejected <laughs> for grants left and right because they didn't think I would pull this off. They didn't think I would go across the country over several months doing this. They didn't think that it was possible or it would cost too much money. Even if I was only asking for maybe a, you know, one to two thousand dollars to cover the performances in their state, it just was, you know, I'm not a resident of your state. You don't have proof of concept. Not interested. And so hmm. I really had to figure out how to make this possible because I knew I couldn't make, you know, I knew I couldn't do this, you know, on my own. And so that's kind of where the Kickstarter part came in. I had a lot of people that said, you should really look into this. I think your project would be a really good fit for Kickstarter. And I, you know, thought, okay, you know, I'll give it a go. And um, so, yeah, Kickstarter campaign launched. And 
I knew that I wanted to do one performance in every state. And it was very much in the early days of Kickstarter. So people were very, it was a lot of educating the public about it, even three years ago, about what is crowdfunding and what do you mean they won't take my money right now? I have to wait 30 days. And there was some of that stuff where it got, I was doing a lot of explaining to people who were backing me what was happening. And I also had a lot of people that took one look at what I did and said, you know, I'm not paying for your six month vacation, you know, because they <laughs> thought that I'd be on vacation the whole time driving and doing whatever. And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> Seeing the biggest ball of twine in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but that's like 15, 20 minutes from where I grew up in Minnesota, believe it or not. Nice. I've seen it a couple times. <laughs> That might be, that's 2020, right? That's the next tour is all of yeah, all the various you twine balls. Yes. <laughs> Me and Weird Al Yankovic, totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, it was a very overwhelming experience to do that. So I was very careful with my funding for Kickstarter. If I, at that point, knew I was going to get it at all, that it would only go towards the concert being produced. It did not go to my personal expenses. It did not go to gas money. It did not go to lodging. It did not go to food. It was literally just those concerts because then people couldn't come back to me and say, well, you know, you stayed in these four-star hotels and blah, 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 you know. I'm like, Ugh. no, I didn't. I slept on this person's couch. Couch surfing was my best friend that year. It was great. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, so, and people forget about all of the side stuff with concerts and concert production too, especially in multiple states. You know, certain venues require liability insurance. You know, mm. even if you mm. have two people who sit in the audience in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> it's like you need to have this liability insurance in case something falls and somebody gets hurt, you know, and that costs money, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted to also with the Kickstarter funding, make sure musicians got paid because I went the old school vaudeville route in that, you know, I had people that, you know, well, are you touring with a band and whatever? And I was like, no, no, let's go back to a hundred years ago and what they did. And what they did historically was that the main entertainment would travel in the vaudeville circuit, but there were so many, you know, musicians in all these towns, right? Because what was the main form of entertainment? It was performing music and silent films, which needed music as, you know, accompaniment. So you had piano players everywhere you went. You had fiddle players or mm. violin players or all of the above. So it was really easy to, con you know, get musicians hired out in each community and then have one rehearsal with them and then do the performance. It was much easier to do it that way. And I wanted to go back to that route, not only because, you know, kind of this historical aspect, but I thought, honestly, it was a way to get, again, community involvement involved with this. You know, if you are hiring mm -hmm. local as much as you can, it, it creates such a great dimension of audience participation, but frankly, it makes the music better because it's yeah. the, the person who's performing with you has more attached emotionally to this and you know this person came all this way and they're doing this here in our town and you know that kind of thing and it was I learned so much in those six months from working from with all of these different piano players and guitar players and banjo players and everything because they all had different styles and they all brought something different to the table and it made my singing better because I worked with different people and I think that mm. that's and the other thing too that I also run into is like People say, well, how did you find people? And there were times where it was hard to find people in some of these smaller towns. But truth be told, there is amazing talent everywhere you go. It isn't yeah. New York City. It is in small towns, too. I mean, phenomenal players, amazing players that I wish had more stage time. And I was lucky enough with my Kickstarter campaign, because it was successful, to be able to pay these people an appropriate wage not just mm. here's a free meal and whatever's in the hat, you know, I just, <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So that was something that I was left for you. About, you can hear. <laughs> what? Yeah. That was more for me. Yeah. 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 You know? and did you and, find and them through okay. the union? When you went to look for musicians, did you look in the union, the musicians union, or did you go to like Craigslist? Like what were your sources for finding musicians? 
what generally ended up happening was that, you know, I have this route to work with, and there's a great Google map of it that's actually interactive that you could take turn by turn on the Lincoln Highway Association's website. It's amazing. And I would look for venues first, and I would either reach out to the venue or I would reach out to their local chamber of commerce. And I would tell them who I was, and I was doing this vintage program of music, you know, the, so they knew the kind of style of music that I would be in period costume while I was doing this, that kind of thing. And I said, first off, do you have any venues, you know, and then they would give recommendations of historical societies or farmers markets mm-hmm. or whatever. But mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, those people knew the best fit for my music. Mm. So. I actually would reach out to them for, you know, it was it was the tell me who would work well with this style. And then yeah. I would usually get a name or two, and then they would, you know, come back to me and say, yes, I'm available, I'd love to do it, or no, I'm out of town, but I know this person who would fit really well with this style. And it was kind of like that old telephone can of everything just kind mm-hmm. of got passed mm-hmm. quickly. And yeah. so once everything kind of got confirmed, it was, um, generally pretty easy. There were a couple of times where it was harder to find players, and then in which case, yeah, I actually did go the Craigslist route and found some amazing players who did it, you know. And, um, yeah, one of my performance, it, I didn't have to do it too much. There was one time where I, I was really in a bind. I couldn't find anybody. I mean, that's one thing about this, and I talked about it in um, my book, too, but it's, I was flying by the seat of my pants with these places because I was going into these different venues. I had never been in there before. When I walked in for the first time, I had no idea what the acoustics were like. I didn't know what the, if the piano would be tuned. Um, I you know, didn't know their playing styles. And so if I, there was one in Nebraska where I could not find a piano player because there was this big festival going on. And they all went out of town on vacation because they didn't want to be there. (laughs) (laughs) So I couldn't find a piano player because they were all gone. And so I went, okay, well, it's kind of a busking thing, scene that they want me to do for this festival so I could find a guitar player or maybe a banjo player because I need to be, you know, not plugged in anyway. You know, who's going to be busking with a keyboard on the side of the road (laughs) during costume? Nobody? (laughs) So it worked better. And I basically knew that, you know, because of Providence and kind of having momentum with the tour at that point, because I'd been on the road for a few months, I knew I had a TV spot that I was going to be doing very early in the morning. So when I posted the Craigslist ad, I was like, to, you know, national touring performer looking for, you know, guitar player who can do performances on the following day, including a television spot and drop that right there. You know, so it's mm-hmm. like in the hopes that it would pull someone in, and it did. It pulled in yeah. someone really well, and nice. um, he was a trooper. But that there's a lot of you know thinking on your feet in ways that you know I think all of us are used to a certain level of flexibility in the arts. You know, of, of that there is critical thinking and there is kind of spontaneity that occurs. But you know, truth be told, it. Uh, it's a little bit different when you're actually in the town and you're like, I still don't have anybody to play for this. And it's like four days away. Eek! Mm, so, yeah. you know, there's times where that happened, but luckily it all worked out in one way or another, you know, it really did. How far, because it, sound, like, it sounds like it was kind of just you doing all this um, and coming fresh off of planning my own event. I know that, uh, preparation time and planning is really important. How far in advance did you begin planning everything and what avenues did you take to market? Yeah. So of course, initial research took years before I even did this. I knew that I had 2013 and I knew I had that to work with. And I actually started reaching out to various markets along the route, including there's actually a, modern Lincoln Highway Association that does road preservation and things like that because I thought these people are going to know the road best and they're going to be probably my best advocate. So I reached out to them two or three years prior to 2013 saying, I'm interested in doing this. Do you even think this is viable? Like, do you even think this is possible with the year of the hundred, you know, the hundred year anniversary? And they said, yes, you know, and I started getting inklings of things, but um, you know, I really, for booking venues, it started in the fall prior, but I was actually booking – I was on the road from the middle of April through Labor Day weekend. It was almost six months. 
And I had to, especially with the Western states, they were like, this, you know, oh, you're looking to book in August, but like, call three months from now. <laughs> they didn't even want to deal with me. It was, you know, I don't know if it's a West Coast thing or what, but people were just like, you know, <laughs> we don't, we, we won't bother. You know, it's, it's too far out. We can't think that far ahead. So when I hit the road in April, all my stuff to, from New York to roughly the Chicagoland area was figured out, but everything kind of west of the Mississippi was still kind of, some things were cemented in some of those states, some things weren't. It just wow. kind of depended on who I'd met. Um, you know, I had some people in some markets, like just good musician friends that lived along parts of the route, so I reached out to them and said, you know, I want help with this, even if it's just a place to stay. You know, so I knew I had places to stay, of course, which is crucial um, for all of this, too. But it was – so some of it was on – the road booking. And at that point, even when I was on the road, um, there's certain parts of it that were so remote. I did have to get help um, from family members to help with booking because I just didn't have the internet access in some of these places mm. to sit and respond to people. Um, you know, it's uh, a quick rundown of the States. It starts in New York city and then you go through New Jersey, Pennsylvania through the mountains, then Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, Nebraska, there's a loop down to Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and then Northern California, and then in San Francisco. And some of those sections, especially like in Nebraska and Wyoming and further west, there just wasn't cell phone reception. There just wasn't internet. There just wasn't anything. And um, mm. there, I was still finalizing certain things, and I had to have people help to say, you know, she's on the road. You know, she probably has phone access but not internet, so if you need to get a hold of her, you have to call because it just was getting difficult. And it's amazing, even in a few years, how much that technology has changed uh, along those lines. Yeah. It's much better. But, you know, when you have a cell phone and, you know, if there's only three people that live in this section of Wyoming you're driving through, why would you have a cell signal? You wouldn't, you know? <laughs> it's just, it's, it, it makes sense. There were parts of Utah where I drove for a few hours, same with northern Nevada, where I just didn't have a signal, you know? And that was um, – Honestly, in our modern age, that was kind of the first, like, wow, we're really going back in time because nothing's <laughs> really changed, you know? Yeah. Even 100 years from now. So uh, that, it was kind of a little bit of both. And I will say, too, with being on the road for so long, there was various attention that I got from the press and from Kickstarter and various other points where – it started to keep fueling. So by the time I got to roughly Illinois and Iowa, like midway through, I had Western people in Western States contacting me to come and perform as well. So there cool. was, because there was enough traction that had developed at that point. And so there were mm -hmm. some of these, I didn't have to find myself, which I was amazed and so excited about, you know, to be part of whatever they were thinking I'd be a good fit for. And it just yeah. made the project that much more unique. Uh, yeah, I implored all of my social media communities, whether it was LinkedIn or Twitter or everything. That was one thing about when I did my crowdfunding, too. I sent messages manually to every single person I knew during that campaign on all fronts. Wow. All fronts. It was like the campaign was like a newborn baby in that sense of like <laughs> you constantly had to keep feeding it. You constantly had to nurture it and tell it how wonderful it is, you know, all that other stuff. But mm -hmm. you really had to stay on top of all of those. Because interestingly enough, some of my friends didn't get the private message on Facebook, but they got the LinkedIn private message and then would mm. donate. It was the yeah. weirdest thing, you know. Like, I'm like, who checks LinkedIn? Well, obviously you did and you gave me money. <laughs> so, hey, right. great. You know, yeah. thank you. That really means did, a lot, you know. Did you hire a marketing team at all, or were you doing all the marketing yourself? Um, pretty much doing it all myself. You know, there was – I will say that Facebook, creating events on Facebook and then just throwing a little bit of money, not a lot, you know, really doing a targeted audience can really go a long way because it can kind of reach that awareness for people who do have computers – you know, that are looking at this and you laugh, but of course there's a lot of demographic with some of this older music where they're not necessarily computer savvy, you know, mm -hmm. which kind of made yeah. it part of, part of the adventure with all of it. But, um, 
it was trying to reach some of those younger markets, some of those that were looking at their grandkids' pictures on Facebook. And so we did do some local promotion of that. Uh, my spouse is an editor for, by trade, and um, he also does work in marketing with his main job. And so the, he was able to also kind of step in for that and see if press releases could get distributed and things like that. But most of the time what would happen would be I'd book an event and someone in the community on my behalf would then go and put out a press release for me and then I'd get lo- – that's how the local press would find me was that okay. someone at that historical society was so jazzed about what I was doing or someone at the Chamber of Commerce just thought it, this was so cool and this is going to be in a book. And, you know, she's going across the country and doing this, that he or he or she or whoever reached out to me then knew about what was happening and, and they'd make sure that by the time I got there, there was already kind of some press. So then I'd also get crowds as well. And that's also what helped. But I, I tell you, there were days where there was a ton of press and I had – you know, less than 10 people in the audience, depending on where I was. And then there were other days where there was no press and I had 150 and they were standing in the back. You know, wow. I, it, it's, it's so weird how some of this stuff happens and it's so frustrating for all of us trying to get out there and do it. You know, you kind of have to, I, you know, keep doing whatever feels intuitively right. I, and I think you should. I, I want to say that, uh, you know, one thing that has really stuck in my mind from this tour, and I could think about this in regards to my whole artistic career, period, whether it was my opera days or my wanting to be Jeff Tate's backup singer days, it's <laughs> something that has stuck with me. And it actually happened on my very first show of the American Songline Tour. I was in New York City, and it was my opening show, and I was doing this show in the West Village. And when I was envisioning the American Songline program, I had a character in mind, like a vaudeville character. And I had her name. Her name was Clara Mae Higgins, and she had done the B circuit of the, you know, I had the whole history figured out, and I had this whole script written. And I thought that people would only be able to relate to me and what I was doing if I was this character back in time and doing it. I was really nervous about that, you know, and then I'm going to New York city and performing, you know, I think no matter what stage you're on in New York city, it feels a little intimidating at first. And so I did this first performance with this character and it was a great show. I mean, it was great energy in the crowd. Everything was fantastic. I had people come up to me afterwards and say, we love you. You don't need to be any character at all please just be you. Your voice is amazing. What you're doing is amazing. Just be you. And it really stuck with me. And it made me think about everything I'd done in my life because that was the key. It was if I had just listened a little bit more to that intuition I had. And if I sat with those ideas I had that were out of the box a little bit longer, knowing that maybe timing is important with things. I think I, I know my... I'm, I am the artist I am today partially because of authenticity and who I am, but I know that I would have had more self-confidence in what I did, you know, even more than we have to do to get that hustle on as a performer and as a musician. But that was something that has resonated to me to this day. So I really think about when I think about my music and my business with this music, it, if it doesn't fit with me uh, authentically, I'm not doing it. And I think there's a lot of us who think that we're doing that and we're not, you know, and it it was just really kind of, I think we want to put a character on stage because we think that's what people will want. Even if it's just yourself being you performing, there's a certain stage version of you that you think that's what everybody wants. And it's Mm. really not the case. I think people even more so in today's technological world with smartphones, they want authenticity and they want it from a place of authenticity even more so. So really stepping into who you are and in that light will just, you know, your passion will speak through and people will see you for who you are, and then they will love you for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter what you do and who you are. They will just love you because that, that's what speaks. That truth is powerful and it's beautiful. So that's what I would have to say in regards to this. Wow. That's awesome. 
And yeah. Cece, we are near the end, and I could talk to you for another hour. I'm sure our <laughs> listeners could listen for another hour. It's been extremely entertaining and educational and um, just really great. Um, I would like to see if you can expound upon any of the yeah. wisdom you've shared with us and just share some final words of wisdom, maybe a, a lesson learned or something that can just send us on our way feeling happy and gleeful. <laughs> happy and gleeful words of wisdom. Wow. There's so or, many. you know, That's negative and, you know, whatever, however oh. you want to do it. <laughs> um, I found so many amazing wonderful people in our communities too, as we, as we went across America and it didn't matter. And I feel the need to say this, especially in 2016 being an election year. Um, I want people to know there's a lot more that unites us than divides us. And I know that amidst all of the chaos of what will be going on this year in our country, there's a lot of people who have those similarities and, you know, get together and, and do things in their communities to make it better. And, and I think people need to really think about that stuff, especially as life gets chaotic and the world gets chaotic. And, you know, that we all love our families and children. You know, we all love, we all want a place to sleep. We all want food to eat. And, you know, that's the most important thing to remember. And I think there's a lot of paranoia in this culture that needs to go away. I had so many people that would say, you know, aren't you scared of going across the country by yourself? And I was like, no, no, because if you go looking for it, it's going to find you. And I think people need to take a step back with that. Um, I will say that I learned I think um, one other interesting thing that I learned on the road was I had a moment with a 94-year-old man who called me while I was on tour because he, again, didn't use a computer. He said, I uh, love what you're doing. I can't make it to your show, but I live along the Lincoln Highway, and I remember riding my pony looking at the cars as I, as we drove by as a little boy, and I want to take you and show you places, and I'll take you to lunch, you know. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, I don't. <laughs> know this guy from anybody and um i got i drove to this place in rural iowa and met this person and he and another friend of his who ran a garage restored antique cars actually we all met we all went to lunch and then we all went back to the garage because that's what you know we do when we socialize right we all go back to the garage and socialize <laughs> and um there were all these cute things that they kind of, they really kind of talked to me about, um, about, you know, or they kept asking me what I thought about the future. And I was blown away because I think there's so many generation divides that, you know, I can't talk to that person because they're older. I can't talk to this, this person because they're younger. And um, it just was hilarious because it was, here are these wonderful gentlemen asking me about my thoughts for the future. And it kind of blew me away, but there was one question that kind of resonated through and I thought about it and it's a good question to leave people on in a funny way, right? Cause you could bring anything. I asked them, I said, if you could travel back, if you had to go back in time and live there permanently, what one thing would you bring with you? Uh, that was, that was the question that came up in our men's socializing hour, I guess. And um, that, uh, it was interesting because I couldn't think of anything that would work and I couldn't think of, you know, and the 60 something year old gentleman couldn't think of anything that worked, but the 94 year old guy who called me, he came to me and he said, or, you know, he said, well, I wouldn't bring anything back. He said, I'd bring something forward. And I was like, what would you bring forward? He's like, um, I'd probably bring volunteerism and then a, you know, and then an old Coca-Cola soda. That's basically what I bring <laughs> forward. And that's all I bring. It was just the one little simple thing, you know, that meant so much to him. But it was, it was just so interesting that he was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring anything back. I'd bring stuff forward, you know. And um, I think it, it's just such a neat thing to think about, you know. I think in regards to so much going on, past, present, and future in our lives. And I think it, it's our own internal ways of thinking about those balances, even if it is the knee-high soda or whatever, whatever soda he wanted that he needed to bring forward. That's, you know, the most important thing, I think. And, um, you know, so, yeah, that, that's 
that's some, you know, between that and Clara Mae Higgins, those are my two pieces of words of wisdom, I think. Well, folks, that wraps up another episode of On the Record. Tune in next week.